Shortly after the New Mexico riot, the Associated Press did a survey of prison overcrowding nationally. The results were startling. 23 states, like New Mexico, had state prison systems already housing more inmates than they were built to hold, and most of the others were at capacity or nearing it. Their prison officials saw troubles ahead. It's only a matter of time before we'll have the same thing in Wyoming, said an official in that state. From a California prison man came this word. I don't want to indulge in any self-fulfilling prophecies, but the more crowded you get, the more likely some riot or life-threatening situation. Prisoners who rioted and took 100 hostages at the Essex County Jail in New Jersey just last month cited overcrowding as their major complaint. Last week in Kentucky, an inmate brought lawsuit was settled after state officials agreed to spend $42 million to relieve overcrowding in two Kentucky prisons. In short, we could have gone to any one of hundreds of prisons around the country to illustrate the overcrowding problem. We chose just one just up the road from here in Maryland, the Maryland House of Correction in Jessup, a medium security prison. It was built in 1879 to hold under 1,000 prisoners. 400 more than that live there now. Their crimes range from minor offenses to the serious crimes of rape and murder. Their sentences range from 90 days to life. Their warden is Paul Davis. There are probably many people that look at the prison system, corrections, and, and say, they're not supposed to be country clubs, these prisons. After all, the people that come into prisons are those who have raped and robbed and murdered, and they ought to be made to pay. I don't argue that, and I won't argue against the debt to society having to be satisfied. However, I think the punishment is the removal from society, the alienation from family and friends and uh, community. I don't think that that, that punishment need be uh, multiplied tenfold by saying, I'm going to put you in a little cage somewhere, we're going to cram you in there with another fellow, and, uh, and we're going to make you suffer 24 hours a day. The suffering is already there. Overcrowding impacts tremendously and most visibly in the housing areas. For instance, in the dormitories, we're housing approximately 119 men in a dormitory that by court order should house only 106 and by actual design should house probably no more than 80. We're probably talking about uh, as little as a foot and a half, two foot between some of the bunks maximum perhaps of three foot as you go into the cells our cells are somewhat smaller even than the minimum requirement for one man we keep two men in many of those cells you got f317 here um temporary resident of adrian way and bobby smith as you can see this is a six by eight very small space for two people very small space. Um, if me and him had to get by one another as he wanted to go out the door, we both had to turn side, we still wouldn't be quite enough room because of this locker here and these two lockers here. Mm -hmm. This is our toilet area. As you see, it's not located very far from where we have to sleep at. If one of us is on the toilet defecating or urinate, or one of us urinating, the smell is, uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it can't ventilate because there's no proper ventilation. What Okay, all right now, if he wants to use the toilet, this is the procedures we got to go through. First, he's got to sit down like this, then I got to move this way, then he's got to get up to, to, to use the toilet. I'm 5'7", that's, that's considered short, even sitting down. If we both, if we sat down, this is as far as your head can go. You can't sit erect, and this is very uncomfortable. To read a book, you have to lay, either lay down or sit on the toilet, which is a very small space in itself. It's depressing. It's, it's, it's a lot of tension builds up, you know, unless you and your cell buddy is, are short, or, you know, really on good time with one another. It, this creates a lot of uh, tension. You might want to get by, and you, he trying to get by, and you bum and say, damn, man, you know, why don't you uh, sit down somewhere, you know, get off my feet or something, man, watch my feet or something, his shoes are in the way or something of that nature. A dog has more room than this. Seriously. A dog has more room than this, man. Staff probably suffers
from overcrowding as much as the uh, residents of the institution. In many cases, you have an officer who is supervising a hundred or more inmates for eight hours a day. Approximately every 30 minutes, I make a complete tour of the uh, dormitory. You check to make sure that the uh, nobody in the dormitory is is ill, or laying down, you know, falling down in the back somewhere and hurt themselves. Uh, nobody's been uh, assaulted. And it's a little easy to get on each other's nerves when you're stuck inside a large room with 119 other men, and people have a tendency to get on each other's nerves. I mean, the man next to you's eating when you're trying to sleep. He wants to talk or listen to a radio station that you don't want to listen to, but you're forced to because you have to live with all the other people. This is my bunk. This is this guy's bunk. If you get a cold, I got one. You understand? You don't have here one room. I mean, you know, you think in terms, you wake up in the morning, you smell the next guy's breath. You sleep just that close to you. You got approximately 1,500 men in the institution. Uh, approximately about maybe 700 men are working. Uh, you got another uh, four or 500 men that are totally idle around here. You know, it's no jobs for them. You know, this uh, constitutes a lot of hostility because the guys don't have nothing but idleness. We're able on any given day to have gainfully employed in some activity about 897 of our inmates. We average about 26% of our inmates in what we call idle status, so that the vast majority of their 24-hour day is spent laying around the dormitory or lying around in the cell. As far as employment in London, we have a waiting list they call a job bank. I have men sending letters out to me all day long. I would like to have a job in laundry. I want work. I don't want to lay around. If you're lucky enough to get in front of classification board for a job, the only jobs they will have will be kitchen or the laundry. The majority of the time, you're going to spend at least 23 hours a day in the cell. I've been here back in the system since the 16th of October. I've yet to see a classification board for any type of employment. I have run around here personally myself and asked for a job, asked for a job. And I was told the job bank is filled up, they have no jobs. Another one of the areas impacted tremendously by the overcrowdedness in the prison is the visit area. We're operating a visit room that is far less than adequate for uh, handling the visits of our 1,294 and yet we're running visits for 1,520 some. What privacy can you have down there? Everybody's all bunched up, because they only give you an hour, and on Sundays they cut that down to 45 minutes. That's not enough to say anything. You sitting elbow to elbow with the next person. There's some things that you want to say to your people that you don't want the next man to hear. Something he want to say to his that he don't want you to hear. Sometimes I get, I get depressed too. You know, you understand what I'm saying? I pick up the old picture and look at it. I said, that's my baby. Man. Benny Harrison, time's up. What does it mean? It means the man goes into a visit today and get some bad news from home. Maybe uh, his brother comes and delivers the Dear John message from his wife or his girlfriend. And he's, uh, there are some hostilities that are building up in this man. And uh, maybe he's one of those few that would like to, in some creative way, get rid of those hostilities. So maybe he wants to go over and bounce a basketball around or beat on a punching bag. He gets to the gymnasium and the basketball courts are crowded. He can't get his hand on a basketball. He can't get his foot on the court. So what does he do? Perhaps he's the guy who goes back to the housing area. And if he's one of the men that is in a cell with another man, perhaps he takes it out on his cell partner. <laughs> 
it usually results in something physical because that's the way men uh, 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 react in here. They don't uh, react on an intellectual basis. Every time they interact, it's going to be some type of physical, you know, or some type of uh, physical threat that's body harm. One of the most critical, yet not so visible, problems that, that we face because of the overcrowded uh, conditions in the institution is the, the ability of our classification counselors to deliver services to the inmate population. You got 10 classification officers to deal with 1,500 men. So you got approximately, I say around about maybe 150 men to one classification arm. Three times a week, our counselors will sit on what we call reclassification teams. Those teams simply take request from the population for classification to another job, another institution, or whatever. And we'll spend an entire day screening anywhere from 40 to uh, 60 or 80 residents. Well, this classification here, and I haven't seen anybody. Only thing I have received is a note informing me that I'm supposed to go in front of the classification board for camp consideration Monday. That's it. Mr. Chavis, the team is going to recommend that you be returned to the camp system. Okay, okay thank any you. Questions? Yes, sir. Okay, that's all. Thank you. We make decisions based solely on available beds and moving men. And men who would not normally be transferred from this institution are transferred because of the push for available beds. Um, little or no thought is put into to his actual past criminal history, just that he meet uh, a certain minimum uh, criteria for being transferred to minimum. Bobby Smith, uh, your counselor has put you in for um, a job change. You're working in the dining hall now, is that correct? You, want, you still want to come out? Well, uh, out, of the, out of here? No, out of the dining hall. No, I never planned to come out of the dining hall. You want to stay there? I've been there ever since, since we, I got We know time. that, but Mr. Geppi said that uh, you told him that you wanted to be reclassified out. No, I never told Geppi, Mr. Geppi that. I put reclassification in for camp. I'm a 90 day check in. Right. Well, well, that this wasn't is, the reason for which right. you were brought here today. Right. Okay, uh, you have to see Mr. Smith about that. He has to put in the recommendation. Uh, yeah, yeah. It gives you a real dim outlook of everything, you know. It's wow, like I'll never get out of here with this many people. There's, there's no way I can get out of here because I can't get enough attention for my counselor because there's too many people in here. And when you compress something for so long like that, you're going to get some type of uh, combustion, some type of reaction. You're dealing with human beings in here. Cover back. The Maryland House of Correction was built in 1878. Since then, it's been expanded and renovated several times to provide space for the state's burgeoning prison population. It's the oldest of seven medium security prisons in Maryland. There was talk in the state legislature a few years ago of demolishing it and replacing it with a modern facility, but the growing demand for prison space has kept it operating. In April 1980, when our first report aired, the Maryland House of Correction had an inmate population of 1,511. That was 215 more than its capacity at the time. One way they made room for the additional prisoners was by placing two inmates in a cell designed for one. You got F317 here, um, temporary resident of Adrian Way and Bobby Smith. As you can see, this is a six by eight, very small space for two people, very small space. Um, if me and him had to get by one another as he wanted to go out the door, we both had to turn side, we still wouldn't be quite enough room because of this locker here and these two lockers here. This is our toilet area. As you see, it's not located very far from where we have to sleep at. If one of us is on the toilet defecating or urinate, or one of us urinating, the smell is, uh, you know, it, doesn't, it, it can't ventilate because there's no proper ventilation. Four years later, the Maryland House of Correction is still overcrowded. A federal court has placed limits on the number of inmates who can be imprisoned there, but those limits have been exceeded almost every month. When we returned to the House of Correction recently, some conditions had improved. 
the old visiting area, which was so cramped that prisoners and visitors couldn't talk without being overheard, had been replaced by a much larger visiting room. And visiting hours had been increased from one to seven days a week. There were no longer two prisoners in a cell. The cells are still small, even with one person, but they were also about the only place in the prison where a man could have the luxury of privacy. One other change was the two new trailer units just outside the main fence. The trailers have beds for 112 prisoners and offer what are perhaps the best living conditions within the prison. Yet in spite of the changes, the prison was still crowded, with 166 more prisoners than its court-ordered capacity. Instead of putting double bunks in the cells, the prison authorities were now putting them in dormitories. In talking with inmates, we found that all the major complaints we heard in 1980 still exist today. As you can see, the bunks are close together. We have no room to put our own things. They allow us to have our own things, but we have no place to put them. Uh, it's hard to read, to even be by yourself in here, to have any time to yourself because people are so close together. It's bad enough that I'm incarcerated, but with wall-to-wall -wall people, arm's length, a man at arm's length on each side of me, a man at arm's length over me, it's just, it's impossible. You sleeping so close to the next guy next to you, you might as well be in the same bunk with him. You turn over at night, he's breathing in your face. You can smell his breath, that's how close he is to you. Slightly more than half the inmates of the prison are housed in dormitories. D-dorm is 121 men crammed into an area that really should hold no more than 80. The overcrowding puts strains on all of the prison's facilities, and in some cases contributes to unhealthy sanitary conditions. The showers are inadequate, the showers are filthy. I've been to the shower and I've seen a, where someone has defecated on the shower floor, things like that. Uh, Fungus on the walls, fungus on the floors. You know. I've been up here 25 months, and for 125 men, we have four toilets at work and two urinals. The toilets and other utilities up there were placed into operation to accommodate the overcrowded problem. When conditions are such, there is a tendency on the part of inmates to do more vandalizing of that equipment. This is because of idleness, nothing else to do. In prison, finding things to do is a constant struggle. These inmates keep themselves busy practicing their music. You know, it's so much tension. I'm saying this is the only space we, we can really, like, let off steam. With free time is what gets you in trouble, man. There's a whole lot of trouble to get into. You may be trying to do positive things, but you always have people that don't have anything on their mind that will actually try to get in your way, knock you from doing whatever you're trying to do. It's, you know, the crab pulling the one that's getting out the basket back in the basket. The prison tries to keep inmates out of trouble by offering them structured activities to occupy their time. The average length of stay is four and a half years, so there's a lot of time to occupy. Now, anybody else who didn't finish... You want the House of Correction offers scholastic and college-level courses. The courses are taught five hours a day and can accommodate between four and five hundred inmates. But many prisoners complain that the courses all have waiting lists. The most sought-after means of killing time are the various prison jobs. The jobs pay a minimal salary and in some cases teach skills which can help inmates get work on the outside. This woodworking shop employs as many as 85 inmates who build desks, chairs, bookshelves and other items for sale to the state and non-profit corporations. But there just aren't enough jobs to go around. The prison's dietary department can employ 177 inmates. Some of those jobs mean getting up very early in the morning, so the kitchen jobs aren't as popular as those in the wood shop, yet there's still a waiting list. 
Charles Taylor had to wait five months to get his job as a cook. Everybody here is trying to get into something, you know, and it's a, it consists of a waiting list. You know, it might take you a year to get in there. You know, so within that year, you know, you're laying around. I applied for this job, and uh, it took me about two months to get it. And in the meantime, in between there, I was just laying around doing nothing. Clifton Anderson has no job. No, I've been trying to get a job since I came here. Mostly, uh, I've worked somewhat on my case, or if not, I'll tell you to play ball or perhaps go to the library. Other than that, I'm idle. The Maryland House of Correction has a population of 1,572, and the 1984 budget allowed the institution to employ 1,146. To apply for a job or other kind of status change, inmates have to go before a classification officer. When this scene was shot in 1980, prisoners were complaining because there were only 16 officers. This year, there are 13 for more than 1,500 inmates. Me in particular, I've seen my classification officer one time in the time I've been here. And that was after many attempts to see him. Uh, same is the case for most everybody else here. You know, uh, if you want to see your counselor, it might take you about seven months to see your counselor, social worker. You know, if you have an emergency problem, it still take you about seven months. The frustration of trying to be heard above the din of 1,500 other men, all clamoring for personal attention, merely adds to the already tense conditions of prison life. I don't think it's, you can describe being locked up, excuse me, your freedom being taken from you. I, um, I don't know how to describe it real. But I know one thing, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a hell of an experience to be locked up. And I wouldn't want to see no one go through it. The state of Maryland now has about 40% more prisoners than prison capacity. Two new facilities in Hagerstown and Baltimore are in the process of being opened, and both of them will be overcrowded, with half the cells housing two prisoners instead of one. A third prison is scheduled for completion in 1987, and officials are already saying that it, too, will have to resort to two prisoners in a cell.